information. Today's webinar is presented by Wendy Richardson, our Family Care Coordinator here at the Johnson Center. The webinar was created by Gina Hill, Certified Child Life Specialist, and Rebecca Flores, the Johnson Center's Registered Nurse. Please note that questions can be typed into the control panel and time permitting, they can be addressed at the end. For those of you that have requested copies of the presentation, we cannot send out the presentation slides. However, we do post recordings of all of our free webinars on the Johnson Center YouTube channel. Please search us for on YouTube and subscribe to get full access to all of our recorded webinars. Please welcome our presenter, Wendy Richardson. Thanks, Tiffany, and thank you all for joining me today for this presentation, A Parent's Guide to Navigating Insurance Coverage. Uh, we chose to present this topic because we've noticed common questions about insurance coveries, coverage from all the families that we serve. Through this presentation, we hope to provide a solid baseline understanding of insurance coverage, including terminology and claims processing. In this presentation, we will cover types of insurance that are available on the market. We're going to talk about the differences between self-funded and traditional insurance policies. We'll define those commonly used terms you hear all the time. We'll go over how to read a sample cl clinic bill, explanation of benefits, how to fill out a claim form. We'll walk through what to ask when you're calling your insurance company about coverage. We'll walk through the process of appealing a denied claim. We'll touch on insurance laws by state. And finally, we will review some frequently asked questions. If there's time at the end, I'll take questions from you. So before we go any further, I want to provide a brief disclaimer. First, we are not insurance lawyers or specialists. We've done our research, but the information presented here is not to be considered legal advice. If you are in a situation in which you believe you have legal recourse with your insurance provider, please contact a licensed attorney. Secondly, along the same lines, please be aware that insurance laws vary from state to state. If you have concerns about mandatory coverage regulations, please contact your state's Department of Health and Human Services. Finally, it's extremely important to bear in mind that every single insurance policy is different. While you may have insurance through the same company as your mother, brother, neighbor, or friend, your coverage will most likely be different. Even if your coworker may have even your coworker may have different coverage if your employer has offers multiple policies. So when we talk about types of insurance, we're talking about how you purchase your policy. You can purchase a policy through your employer. You can purchase a policy on your own in the individual market. And if you're interested in learning more about purchasing individual insurance, you can review this guide published by the Wall Street Journal, listed here. Or if you're eligible, you may receive public insurance like Medicaid or Medicare. Please visit healthcare.gov to find out more about public insurance programs. Whether, you're per whether you purchase private insurance through your employer or individually, it's important to note if you have a traditional plan or a self-funded plan. When we talk about traditional versus self-funded, we're talking about money. We're talking about whether the money paid out for claims, where it comes from. We're also talking about who decides what's covered in your plan and what the benefits will be. In a traditional insurance policy, um, the plan is negotiated between the employer and the big insurance company. They determine the coverage, the premiums, what is your deductible, and money to pay claims comes from the insurance company, the employer, and the employee premiums. Self-funded insurance is very different. In a self-funded plan, the details of the cost and the coverage are designed by the employer, 
or the group using the plan. Uh, so one of the differences is, and we have an example at the bottom, is that um, members uh, can write to and go to the employer and say, this is not covered on our plan and a group of us would like it to be included. And we have an example at the bottom um, where a family went to their employer to add ABA benefits to their self-funded plan, uh, even includes a sample of the letter that they wrote and uh, they were successful. So that's something to research if you have a self-funded insurance plan and that's one of the benefits. Um, a typical insurance company like Aetna or Blue Cross will act as the administrator of the policy. So they do all the paperwork. You'll have a typical insurance card. Um, the other difference, the self-funded plan is only subject to federal regulations, not state regulations. So now that we know where your insurance policy comes from, let's dive into defining some universal terms used by virtually all insurance providers and clinicians. It's important that you know and understand these terms in order to best understand your coverage. So a premium. Think of your premium as your monthly membership or subscription payment. Uh, it can be taken from your paycheck pre-tax if you have a policy through your employer, and it can be billed to you if you purchase an individual policy. A deductible, a specific dollar amount that you pay out of pocket to service providers before your insurance plan pays you anything. Uh, renews every contract year. Uh, some services like annual well visits are exempt from deductibles. Uh, and you could have separate deductibles for different types of services, like a medical deductible versus a behavior deductible. You hear people talk about high premium, low deductible, and vice versa. A high premium, low deductible means you pay out more each month for your membership. And when you have medical bills, you have to pay less out of pocket before your benefits kick in. Conversely, with a low premium, high deductible plan, you pay less each month, but you have to pay more for medical services before your benefits kick in. Uh, in network, your insurer negotiates with a wide range of doctors, specialists, hospitals, labs, and pharmacies to pay a set price for things. These are the providers in your network. Your insurance provider will typically pay a higher percentage of your claim if you receive care in network out of network. These are providers outside your network who have not agreed to any set rates. Your plan may require higher co-pays, deductibles, co-insurance for out of network care. Your plan may not cover out of network care at all, leaving you to pay the full cost yourself. So more on out of network. Um, you'll most likely pay the entire cost of the appointment at the time you're there, unless other arrangements have been made. Coverage comes in the form of reimbursement. Your out-of-network provider may or may not submit those claims on your behalf. So again, commonly used terms, the in-network is where your doctor negotiates special rates with your insurance provider. And out-of-network, they have no relationship with your insurance provider. So a Venn diagram of two circles that never meet. A copayment, you probably all know about copayments, a specific charge for a medical service or supply. So, for example, your insurance may require a $20 copayment for an office visit or a brand name prescription drug, after which the insurance company often covers the remainder of the charges. So, for example, you have an office visit and the doctor charges you $100. Your insurance policy says you have a copay for that service. Of $20, the doctor's office will charge your copay at the appointment and your insurance will be billed the remaining $80. Remember how you paid in full at your out of network appointment and are expecting reimbursement? If there's a copay on that service, that amount will be used to calculate how much you will be reimbursed after that appointment. So in-network copays are paid by the patient up front at the time of service. 
and out-of-network copays are calculated into your reimbursement later. Coinsurance is the percentage that you're required to pay for covered medical services after you've satisfied any copayment or deductible. So, for example, if your insurance company covers 80% of the cost of a specific service, you will be required to cover the remaining 20% as your coinsurance. So again, this is after your deductible has been met. So the difference is that a copay is a set dollar amount usually paid up front, and coinsurance is a percentage that is usually billed after insurance has paid their percentage. Being billed later for services only applies to the in-network services. We'll address the claims process of out-of-network coverage later. Another commonly used term, annual maximum. Maximum dollar amount your insurance will pay in a contract year. So there may be separate maximums for specific services like ABA or medical visits, diagnostics, and your policy may also limit services by number of visits per contract year. Um, and also make a note, when is your contract year? It could be January to December, or just any period of 12 months, depending on the policy. Reasonable and customary charges. So, often responsible for higher co-pays than expected, each insurance provider calculates their own reasonable and, cu and customary fee schedule. So this is a dollar amount an insurance carrier is willing to pay for a specific service. It's determined by geographic location. They'll say like, okay, everyone in this zip code is allowed this. Um, it comes into play when you go out of network. For example, if you have a chest x-ray at your out-of-network doctor, it may cost $120, but your insurance carrier may determine the reasonable and customary charge for your area is only $100. So here's a diagram that explains the differences. For example, in-network, the fee might be $250, the reasonable and customary is $200, Doctors would have negotiated to write off $50. If you have an 80-20 plan, insurance would have paid $160. And then you have a copay or coinsurance of 20% of $40. And your total cost to you would be $40. You can see in out of network that the charge is the same, $250. Reasonable and customary is $200. But because it's out of network, you have a 60-40 plan. So it's $120. Your 40% coinsurance is $80. So that leaves you with $50 that hasn't been written off by the doctor because they're not contracted in network. So your total cost is actually $130. So that's just an example of in network versus out of network and why they're different. So far in our term section, we've talked about where the money comes from when we talked premiums and deductibles. We talked about what your insurance will cover when we talked about copays, coinsurance, and reasonable and customary charges. Now we're going to talk about coding and how your insurance company processes claims. So a diagnosis code. This code tells your insurance company why you had an appointment or other medical service. It's usually a three-digit code. It may include decimals. Um, and as you imagine, it's used to group and identify diseases, disorders, symptoms, poisoning, adverse effects of drugs and chemicals, injuries, and any reason for a patient encounter. We've made a sample here um, just so that you can see um, <clears throat> the diagnosis codes. These are totally made up and um, just a sample of a statement. Um, and highlighted in purple are the three digit with a decimal um, diagnosis codes. You'll also have a CPT code. That stands for procedure or current procedural terminology. So this code tells the insurance company what happened at the appointment. It's a five digit code. 
um, and it will identify a specific clinical service. So the type of office visit, the type of x-ray, etc. Here's a sample showing you on a statement that five digit code. So notice diagnosis codes are above and highlighted in purple is your five digit uh, CPT code. So just as another example, um, the diagnosis code is for the broken leg and the CPT code is for putting a cast on it. So again, the coding system is determined and maintained by the American Medical Association. It's used universally in the United States to process insurance claims in both public and private insurance. So uh, those codes are universal. Um, a special note, uh, codes can only be determined by qualified clinicians. To change a code on a claim without the approval of a licensed clinician is insurance fraud. So you've all seen these and probably wondered about them. An EOB, that's the explanation of benefits that you get in the mail. It's a document provided by your insurance company outlining how benefits were paid out for a specific claim. Um, so in network, this EOB will arrive after your care provider has processed your claim. Um, if you're out of network, it will arrive after you've submitted for reimbursement. Your EOB may come with a check or a denial of why they're not sending you a check. So again, the EOB is not a bill. It's explaining to you why you're getting money or not getting money. Here's an example. We just made up a kooky EOB here, and you could just see um, all the different elements, um, and it'll say deductible, what your copay was, what the provider was paid, what is the patient responsibility, and it should also say this is not a bill. Pre-authorization. So this is a decision by your insurer that a service treatment plan, prescription drug, or durable medical equipment is medically necessary. It's also sometimes called prior authorization, prior approval, pre-certification. So every insurance company may call it something different. Um, your insurance may require pre-authorization for certain services before you receive them, except in an emergency. So here's an example. Um, and it's always good just to ask the question, does this need to be pre-authorized? For example, if your child is already receiving 20 hours a week of ABA therapy, but has been referred to a behaviorally based feeding clinic, so that can be five days of intervention, six hours a day, that can look different from traditional ABA. So those additional 30 hours may be considered outside the scope of your ongoing ABA program, and you may need to be approved for this special intervention. So pre-authorization forms need to be completed along with the documented necessity from your clinician. It's always good to ask the question. It's always good to put in the forms so that it's approved before you have the service. So you must wait for confirmation in writing that insurance will cover it. And you also have to allow 30 days to hear from your insurance on that. So now you speak the language of insurance. How do you find out about your coverage? You must call your insurance company to determine your coverage for specific services. So the staff at the Johnson Center has put together a worksheet for calling your insurance company to determine coverage. And this is really helpful to gather your information uh, even before you start. So the link is available on our website, um, and I'll talk more about that. Um, oh, in fact, there's the address. So again, you want to gather all your details before you get on the phone with them. And it asks for things like your clinic and your practitioner's ID numbers. So like we all have social security numbers your clinicians have ID numbers. Clinics have federal ID numbers. Practitioners have something called an NPI number. This will also help your insurance company find the correct information for your appointments. 
So you want to make a list of those numbers for all your practitioners um, and your clinic will provide those to you and keep those in a place that you can refer to easily. So the first thing you're going to go through is, um, you know, the clinic name, tax ID, your the credentials, which can come into play. So you want to make a note, you know, are they a DO or an MD? Um, and also their clinic address. If they work at multiple locations, you want to know that they're you're covered at a specific clinic. Um, also, if you are an existing patient with a provider, you can call the clinic and ask if they can provide the CPT codes that the appointment will be billed under. However, if you're a new patient, this code may not be available or may change once you see the clinician. So not, jot down what your CPT code is that you're going to be calling them about. And if no CPT code can be provided, list the nature of the appointment or the therapy. So you're going to call the member number on the back of your insurance card. And again, you don't have to take notes because you can download this worksheet off our website and just fill in the blanks as you go. So make a note of the person you're talking to and the date and the time of the call. Um, they often just give you their first name and a last initial. So every you might talk to six different people on one insurance call. So you always write down the new name, the date, and the time of the call. Um, is there a call reference number? This is important if you need to call back, if you have an appeal pending, because you want to be able to say, I talked to Jane at 1215 on Saturday the 19th. This is the call reference number if you need to look up. Um, so you want all your details. Also, uh, some insurance providers employ specialists in their customer service departments. These specialists will have greater knowledge of treatment, procedures, and coding for patients with a specific need, like autism or diabetes or cancer. So ask if you can be assigned a liaison that's a specialist in your area. So find out if your appointment coverage is covered under a medical plan, a behavior plan, um, they're often, they can be even two different companies within your insurance. Um, and the description of services or CPT code will help them determine um, which plan to look into. Uh, if it's a behavior plan, you'll likely to be transferred to a whole new department. So again, who are you talking to? What is the number you called? Who, because it's going to be different. What time were you talking to them? What was the date? What's the new call reference number? Um, this may come into play later. So if you don't have a diagnosis code because you have not yet seen the clinician, you may be able to find out which diagnosis code the insurance company will look for in order to cover the CPT code in question. Um, so the next thing you're going to do is give the representative the clinic's name, the tax ID number, your provider's name, and their NPI number. So you can ask, are the services at this clinic in network or out of network with my policy? And then again, if you have your CPT codes, you can give it to them or the description of the service. And uh, you always want to ask, is there a time limit on the length of the appointment? Find out, do they cover an hour? Do they cover 50 minutes, 45 minutes? Um, and if your service is covered, what percent will they reimburse you after your deductible have, has been met? So they'll typically say, oh, we'll pay 80% of customary charges after your $2,000 deductible has been met for this child. So you're going to write down what percentage are they going to reimburse you and what is your deductible. If the provider is out of network, ask if there is a fee schedule of reasonable and customary charges. If so, what is the reasonable and customary charge for the service that you want to do? Um, if you're out of network, you want to say, you know, what's the reasonable and customary charge for an hour of speech ther therapy in my area? Um, 
This question may also require a call to a different department at the insurance company. Again, what is the name of the person you're talking to, the time you called, the date you called? Um, okay, so then you want to say, here's what my clinic charges, $100 an hour for this service. Insurance says reasonable and customary is $80, so the difference is $20 that I would be out of pocket. Is the service subject to a deductible? If so, how much of your deductible do you have left to pay this contract year before insurance begins to cover the service? Clarify that the information is for in-network or out-of-network because these can be different amounts. And remember, you may have separate deductibles for medical and behavior services. You want to ask, is there a copay for each visit? with this CPT code. In-network copays are paid at the time of the service. Out-of-network copays are calculated into your reimbursement. So you also want to ask, is there a maximum number on the amount of appointments I can have of this service per year? Could be 20 appointments. So you want to make a note of that so you don't go over the 20 visits a year that they're allowing you. Clarify again. Is that 20 visits in network or 20 visits out of network? Because they can be different. Is there a ceiling on the total dollar amount that you'll pay for this specific service each year? Again, if they say we will only pay for $20,000 of ABA per year, you want to know what that ceiling is to keep track of it. Um, this information is very important when finding out about coverage for ongoing intervention, like we said, such as speech therapy, etc. It's always good to ask, does a pre-authorization letter or form need to be submitted and approved for this service? Um, if the answer is yes, you're going to download the pre-authorization form from the form section on the carrier's website and give it to the clinician staff to be completed. And then you want to follow that through, making sure it gets faxed, calling the next day, making sure they actually received it, that it's in the queue, that they're looking at it. Um, so always a good idea, does this have to be pre-authorized before I start the service? Also, is there a certain credential a cl clinicians must hold to conduct this type of service or appointment? So for example, can diagnostics be done by a counselor? Uh, typically, it has to be a licensed psychologist for certain things. You just want to make sure that you know the credentials that they will pay for, for those appointments. If your service will be out of network, um, where on their website can you print a claim form? Because that will be up to you to submit the claim. Ask how long it takes to process your claim and issue you a reimbursement check. And write this on your calendar to follow up. You always want to copy all of your claim documents and file them in your binder with these call worksheet notes. Um, if you receive conflicting information on the billing of this appointment, you can call your insurance carrier back, use those reference numbers, and say, I talked to Sally at 1215 on the 19th, and this is what they told me. That differs from what you just sent me. Here's my reference number for the phone call. Um, so that's the uh, worksheet, again, that you can download off our web website that's very helpful every time you call insurance. Now let's talk about filing that out-of-network claim. So use the invoice from the clinic to find your coding information. Attach a copy of your claim form that you'll get off your insurance company's website and mail it to the claims address. Also, don't put this off. They have rules about how far back they'll process a claim, like six months. Um, so you want to get it in there so that you can get your money back. You're going to keep a photocopy of the entire claim in your insurance binder and record the date you mailed it. By federal law, insurance must reply. So that means they can approve it, deny it, or ask you for more information in 30 days. Note on your calendar when to follow up on the claim if you don't receive a reimbursement check, a denial letter, or that they haven't requested more information. Um, always file claims to ensure that any covered services count towards your deductible. 
you may not actually know, but it's just good to send it in, even if you think perhaps it will not be covered. <clears throat> so the next thing that we'll talk about um, is the in-network claims. If you go in-network, the claim will be processed by the clinic or the hospital that you visited. If you have a copay, they will most likely charge you for it upfront and bill you for your coinsurance after your insurance has paid their portion. Let's talk about appeals. If your claim is denied, you have a right to appeal. If your services were received in network and the claim was processed by your clinic's billing department, contact them for assistance with appeals. If your out of network claim was denied, you can take the following actions to appeal the denial. It's very important that you read your insurance policy regarding the appeal process, the rules for it, the timeframes, and the information you need to provide. So again, those instructions um, should be outlined um, in your EOB. If not, contact your insurance company or your human resources department. Appeals may require specific forms or just a letter. Find that out. Um, note if your insurance imposes a time frame for appeals. So there's multiple levels of appeals. Um, there's a first, second, and external appeal level. Appeals go through a process of ranks, with the first being a basic appeal usually done in writing. If you're denied and you wish to appeal again, it will go through a second appeal process that typically involves a telephone or in-person conference with the insurance agent. Some insurance companies offer an external appeal process if your appeal is denied on the basis that is not medically necessary. <clears throat> it's experimental, investigational, a clinical trial, a rare disease treatment, or out of network. This type of appeal is reviewed by an independent and external medical expert who will make the final call of either approval, overturn, or denied. In urgent situations, an expedited appeal process may be considered. Examples of urgent situations include approval for hospice care, home health, or rehabilitation centers. Um, so first you need to understand why did my insurance deny coverage for this treatment in order to effectively go through the appeals process. A reason will usually be given on your EOB. If the treatment or medication or service is clearly listed in your insurance policy as an uncovered service, there's almost no value in appealing. However, if there's no mention of the treatment you are seeking or if coverage is unclear, the appeal may be more effective. So to write an appeal letter. When going through an appeal process, write your own appeal letter. Uh, you know your child and their needs and their conditions um, more than anyone else. Don't wait or expect your clinical provider to write the letter or to call the insurance company for you. When writing an appeal letter, be very specific and detailed. This is your opportunity to share with the insurance company why a medical treatment would be beneficial for your child's condition. Will this treatment prevent further illness or disability? Reduce hospital stays? Um, will it save the insurance company money? How will not having this treatment worsen your child's condition? Will the lack of this treatment cause the insurance company to cover more expensive medical treatments, something that they want to avoid? What treatments have you tried in the past? List everything that was tried, whether successful or failed. Why do you think this treatment will be more successful and possibly cost effective for the insurance company than other things you've tried in the past? The insurance company is going to want data or proof of medical necessity and previously used treatments. Along with your appeal letter, provide evidence from medical records indicating recommendations for this treatment as well as previously tried treatments. If lab results demonstrate evidence of treatment necessity, provide those as well. Can usage of this treatment or service be medically justified? 
Are there published articles and studies that support the treatment of your child's condition? Provide this information in your letter. Do not insert magazine articles or newspaper clippings. You're trying to convince a group of medical professionals that this treatment is necessary. Do not write an excessively long letter that details your emotions or thoughts about the treatment. Keep it brief, keep it factual about why you're appealing, your child's current medical condition, and how this treatment would be beneficial and cost effective, how lack of this treatment can be detrimental to your child's health and expensive, and publish studies supporting your appeal. Make dated copies of your letter to keep and send out. Keep track of when you sent out the letter and when you should expect to receive a response. And above all, be patient and persistent and don't give up. So let's talk a little bit about insurance laws state by state. We cannot possibly cover all state regulations in this presentation, but we want to plant the seed and arm you with the right tools and knowledge to find out what your rights are in terms of insurance coverage in your state. Um, so first, you want to check with your State Department of Health and Human Services to find out your insurance rights in your state. There might be state mandates for coverage of minors or autism coverage that you need to know about. So remember first, those self-funded plans that did not have to adhere to these state mandates, they only have to adhere to federal ones. Here's an example of a state mandate we just plucked South Carolina, but if you have a self-funded plan, they don't have to follow these rules. So uh, in South Carolina, they require a health insurance plan to provide coverage for the treatment of autism spectrum disorder. To be eligible for benefits and coverage, the individual must be diagnosed with ASD at age eight or younger. The benefits and coverage provided must be provided to any eligible person under 16 years of age. Note, speech language services are not specifically designed, defined in the statute. Coverage is limited to treatment that is prescribed by the insured's treating medical doctor in accordance with a treatment plan. And although behavioral therapy is not specifically defined, the statute does set out a cap of $50,000 a year for coverage of behavior therapy. So again, this is different in every state. You need to check and see what do they demand in your state um, for your coverage. Um, we'll briefly talk about HSA versus FSA. Um, some of you may have a health savings account or a flexible spending account. Um, both are accounts with debit cards that they can be used to pay medical bills and expenses. Both take funds from your paycheck pre-tax. There's a lot more to be said about HSA and FSA, but for the purposes of this presentation, we're only going to touch on them briefly. Um, please talk to your HR manager about your options at your company if you are interested in learning more. So HSA, typically um, available on high deductible plans, funds roll over every year, annual contribution limits apply, can be used for any medical expense. A flexible spending account, also only available on high premium low deductible plans, funds do not roll over. If you do not use them, they are lost. Annual limits apply and are much lower than an HSA and can be used for any medical expense. Also, you know, just ask your HR manager about your options where you are. The following are some helpful questions to ask your provider prior to your visit. Make a note of the date and the name of the person that you speak with, and remember, if you're covered by insurance, um, your out-of-network expenses may be higher, therefore it's important to ask if payment plans or grants are available from your clinic. Oftentimes they have those in place and you just need to ask. So, 10 questions that we hear about and to ask your healthcare provider. Do you participate in my plan's network? Uh, do you have in, an insurance coordinator or other staff member who can assist me? Uh, will you file claim forms for out-of-network services on my behalf so I don't have to do it? Will your office check with my insurance plan to confirm if pre-authorization is needed for this service that I want? 
can you tell me which procedure codes you will likely submit for the services I receive? Um, so those are good questions. Um, can you provide me with your practitioner's NPI number? Will I be required to provide proof of insurance before scheduling an appointment? Do you offer payment plans, discounts, or grant opportunities for services? Can we use our FSA or HSA card to cover the expenses? And 10, what labs or tests may be ordered for my visit and will they be covered by my plan? And even if you are at the clinic and labs are suggested, you can step away, get on the phone, call your insurance and say, hey, I need to do this diabetes test. Is this test covered um, before you actually get the labs done? Um, your HR department uh, can be a wealth of information. So before sitting on hold with your insurance company with your worksheet out to fill in the blanks, check with your HR department as they may be able to answer many of your coverage questions. So here's some questions for your HR department. Do you have a list of in-network primary care providers? Do you have a list of referrals for specialty care providers? Uh, am I required to stay in network to receive coverage or is out of network coverage included? Will this office assist me in submitting out of network claims? When is open enrollment and at what point can I make changes to my current insurance plan? So thank you for participating in our insurance webinar. Be sure to visit our website uh, www.johnson-center.org for more resources and information. Um, there's the address to print out those insurance call worksheets that you'll want to use before um, getting on the phone with your insurance company. Um, we also have uh, references listed, um, all the places that we have uh, gleaned information. Um, on this. Uh, okay, so thank you again, and um, I'm sorry that we don't have time to take any questions. Uh, this will be posted on our Johnson Center YouTube channel, so you can go to YouTube and search for Johnson Center uh, for this presentation. Thank you.